to, to, to make a rough analogy uh, with what I've been talking about and, and, and to kind of, kind of integrate it more with the course, uh, one could speak of that everyone has within him or her the, the true melas, which is the, which is the song of love. Right, so the song of prayer, as most of you know, the pamphlet begins with this, with this beautiful expression of the song, the father sings to the son, and the son sings, sings to the father. Right? It's a song without words, it's a song without melody, it's a song without notes. Right? Uh, there's that, that beautiful passage at the beginning of chapter 21, the forgotten song, where Jesus talks about this song that is in everyone. And he tells us in that section, the notes of the song are nothing. Right. It's the song itself that, that is what's important. But the notes itself is nothing. But that song is in everyone. Right. All right. That's the song of our oneness. That's the song of our true self, uh, with a capital S. All right. That's a song that has nothing to do with anything here. All right. Again, uh, for me, that's the song that, uh, that Beethoven uh, attained. Uh, uh, a conductor once said uh, of Beethoven and Mozart that, that Beethoven's music reaches heaven and Mozart's music comes from heaven. So what you find, find in Mozart's music, probably everything is to, to, just a reflection of, of that love. But what you find in Beethoven, again, because his, his work really is a process, is you, is you really experience the, the attainment of that, of that piece of heaven and that love and that song. Right? And then when you listen beyond the notes, that's what you hear. Right. Right. However, the reason we all are in this world, in this body, is that we are terrified of that song and we have fled from it. And so if you really listen to people, what you will hear will be the block or the defense against that love. So when I spoke about, about Schubert earlier, what I was able to hear in his uh, second trio was that there was a place where he stopped. Where Beethoven continued, Schubert stopped. And he said, I'm just not going to go there. With, there's a block. And all blocks are fears, are expressions of fear. You know, uh, many different places Jesus tells us that the core of every dream is fear. Now, of course, you could also add sin and guilt, et cetera. But, uh, but fear is the core. And, and the ultimate fear, which is what drove us into the arms of the ego in the first place, is the fear of letting that song be who we are. For in the presence of that song, all the notes disappear. Right? And we like being a note. We like being specific. Right? We like having everything orderly. Right? Bert Wrangler used to say, and, and he could be quite critical of conductors, not quite what the vituperation right, Wagner was, but, but he was quite critical of conductors who felt, and he quoted one conductor, he never named who he was, uh, as saying that, that the, the, a conductor has done his job when he has rehearsed the orchestra so perfectly that he's not even necessary for, for, for the performance because everything then becomes very set and you know exactly where the music is going to go. And for Foot Frank, it was exactly the opposite. Right, so that if you listen to, to any of his performances, especially the live ones, you'll hear lots of wrong notes, you'll hear some false entrances. Uh, the orchestra is not always quite together, but you will hear a sweep, a kind of a rhythmic sweep uh, that will take your breath away. And you will experience that what he's doing on the podium is recreating the same inspiration that the composer had. Right, so it became a lived experience. And what Foot Wrangler said, which, which is the point I'm making here, is that conductors become afraid of that, so therefore they rehearse every detail. So that the night of the performance, there are no surprises. All right, the, the orchestra is not surprised, and the conductor is not surprised. And the audience that has come to expect this is certainly not surprised either, because it's always exactly the same. All right, with a Foot Wrangler or someone who conducted in his tradition, uh, uh, as Wagner again basically established, it's, it's all different. Everything is a new experience. Right. Well, it's the same thing in our, our relationships with each other. Right. If you open yourself self up, you will hear how the block, how, how the fear in the other person is interfering with their letting that song of love just flow through them. Right. That's what Freud talked about when he, when he, when he identified defenses. Right. 
And actually, the thing, one of the things that, that, that he emphasized a great deal in, in terms of how, how analysts ought to be was that they should listen. He was very, very strong about that. You should listen. And if you listen carefully, your patient will tell you what the problem is. Not necessarily in words, but you'll hear the block. Right? And if you read Freud, for example, from that point, point of view, you'll realize he's coming from that same tradition, that, that you listen and people will tell you. Right? So, so, for example, Freud, uh, uh, he did this with dreams, he did it with slips of the tongue, he did it with jokes. And in fact, he, he, he said that, that you could do this with everybody. People will always tell you what is going on in them. You watch how they dress, you watch how they walk, you watch how they speak, you watch how they handle themselves, you watch what they say, you watch what they don't say, you watch the slips, you watch the mistakes, you listen to the dreams, and they will tell you but you have to listen. You get beyond the technique, you get beyond what is verbal, you get beyond your own understanding, and you open up your heart. Uh, at, at, the, at the top of, of his score for, for the Miss Solemnis, Beethoven wrote, from the heart, may it go to the heart. And I wrote this from the heart, may it reach the heart of the listener. Right. That's what you want to do. You want to come from, from that heart of love inside and be able to hear the heart of love in someone else. And then the fear of that love and the way that the person then interferes with that. There's a, a beautiful, beautiful phrase uh, in the obstacles to peace, in the third obstacle where Jesus talks about the attraction of death and the mournful figures, the black draped figures uh, that ha have embraced death, which really is all of us. And Jesus talks about how you touch them with the gentle hands of forgiveness. And then the drapes just fall away. You touch them with the gentle hands of forgiveness. That basically, in a nutshell, is what healing is. You feel the block. You feel the fear. You don't judge it. You don't criticize it. You don't try to fix it. You don't try to manipulate it. You don't hate it. You don't demand it be different. You just touch it with the gentle hands of forgiveness, which you cannot do if your hands are not gentle. And your hands are not gentle if you don't allow yourself to be open to that, to that love. There's another passage in the psychotherapy pamphlet where Jesus is talking about if the therapist feels in any way that he has a need, he won't be able to hear. But any point you feel you, you need something from this other person, and we're just not talking about psychotherapy, we're talking about any relationship on any level. If you need something from that other person, you won't be able to hear. Because that neediness, which of course is specialness, will interfere with your touching the block with the gentle hands of forgiveness. Which means the job of the therapist, the job of the person, regardless of the profession, regardless of the relationship, is always to get past that neediness. That's why the, there's so much in this course on letting go of specialness. If there's a neediness, you will not hear. You'll be listening through your own filter, which will distort what you're hearing. When, when there is no filter, when there is no need, when you are in that holy instant, then you would automatically hear. You would, you would hear the block. So, in the Course, when Jesus talks about the Holy Spirit's judgment, and the judgment is either people are expressing love or calling for it, that's what we're talking about. Either people are expressing that inner melody, that forgotten song of love, or they are so afraid of it that they have to defend against it. And therefore, they are calling for the love that they have denied, the love that they have defended against, and above all, the love that they do not believe they deserve. That's what you would hear. Right? As I say, say many, many other times, it makes no difference whether that person is expressing love to you or calling for it, your response would still be loving. So you don't even have to know. And if there is a block, if the person is calling for love, which of course we do 99.9% .9 of the time, the love in you would automatically reach out and touch the pain, touch the hurt with those gentle hands. Right. which means you would say, you would do whatever would be appropriate, whatever would be helpful. 